Elementary, dear data, a matter of honor, the measure of a man, and shades of gray. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh <laughs> Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing our Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2 review special. This is like raging through all of season two. Some say it's the best season of Star Trek ever. Uh, more on that in a moment, especially Shades of Grey. But how you doing today, Sirach? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Sirach's got all of his notes this. organized. Yeah, I got my notes here, but I'm also ready to put these seasons behind us <laughs> and get to the good stuff. A after this, well, th well, there's plenty of good stuff in here. Uh, <laughs> so let's just get into it, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Please make sure you like this video. Please make sure you are subscribed to the channel. If you're listening in, give us a five-star rating and a nice review. We'd really appreciate it. And remember, if you're listening in, you can watch all of these episodes on YouTube. Just type in The Seventh Rule. If you're watching on YouTube, please go over and find us wherever podcasts are found and subscribe to our podcast and listen to us there. We also have the seventh rule two. That's the seventh rule with the number two, where we cover all new Star Trek, like Discovery, Lower Decks, Strange New Worlds, Picard, and Prodigy. All right. So first things first, season two kicked in. It was a rocky first season, but we had Denise Crosby to walk us through it, to get us through it, to hold our hand, to keep us having fun. Season two comes in. Yeah. And the first episode is The Child, in which Deanna is impregnated by an unknown, unknown alien life form. And we're introduced for the first time to Dr. Catherine Pulaski. We've got Pulaski joining in. We've got Guinan joining in. Uh, Crush, Beverly Crusher is gone. There's just all this new stuff. It's like a fresh new start. What'd you think? <clears throat> yeah, um, Guinan's hat jumped out to me. <laughs> uh, that, this was the episode. Um, we also had a little bit more of Colomini, some more Chief O'Brien in this uh, first episode. But uh, that was the yeah, other the one, yes. that, Yeah. And the, the thing that jumped out in this episode, I, I don't know, it was hard for me to believe the whole child and happening that fast in the way it happened. You know, it, it from start to finish. And the one camera kind of climbing up Deanna's yeah. body slowly. It, it was a little weird. It, it was a little weird. Um, I also remember how alone I, I kind of recall Deanna feeling in that moment because it was like she went through that whole pregnancy by herself. It was like Riker was like, "Oh, you're pregnant. All right, whatever. All right, I'm gonna be busy <laughs> over here then. Oh, oh, suddenly, boy, I gotta work double shifts for the yeah. next eighteen years." <laughs> I'm signing up for the away missions. Yeah. So <laughs> I got a it captaincy got, got on a, a new weird. ship. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that was kind of weird. Um, but I did like the introduction to Guinan. I started off also with a um, kind of an animosity towards Dr. Pulaski. And uh, because I had an, an attachment already at that point with Dr. Crusher. So I yeah. did kind of, you know, was standoffish about her in the beginning yeah yeah a, lo a lot of new characters were introduced i remember that was what hit me too yeah uh chief o'brien pulaski guinan you know it's sad about losing crusher but kind of like wow we're it's it's a show that's expanding it's growing really excited i'm thinking oh we're gonna see so much of these characters but we kind of really didn't uh the second one was episode two where silence has leased the enterprise encounters a mysterious void in space when they move in closer to investigate further, it envelops them and they can't get out. This felt like an original series episode to me. Uh, what was the name of this episode? Where Silence Has Lease. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it did feel like original series episode. Uh, this one, what I remember were the aliens in this because I drew a couple of them. One was like a little pumpkin head guy and. Uh, I think that's uh yeah the, the fight, fight simulator. Scene. Yes, you're right. Yes. So that's what I remember from that episode. Um it did feel like an original 
series episode had that kind of feel of the just the way the sets were designed a little just designed and filmed um but also i want to go back to that first episode uh favorite line and i just remembered it in my notes is uh data data what's the difference he's like one is my name the other is not that was so (laughs) good yeah what's the difference well one is my name (laughs) yeah that it's literally that simple yes keep it like that yeah uh not a ton about where silence has least felt the original series to me it was interesting it was fun it was cool but you know nothing horribly memorable from it just a good solid episode what was memorable to me was elementary dear data because now data is being sherlock holmes and he creates the program character professor moriarty well came from uh sherlock holmes the the story but he you know he has that program and moriarty as we know comes back later on in picard and he's kind of an arch nemesis um in the sir arthur conan doyle books but also in next generation yeah um i i did like this episode um it was interesting it it brought in that um like sherlock holmes kind of feel is that what we saw yep. in this episode mm-hmm. and and that beca- became a thing later on and it also became a thing later later on in other shows when you had uh bashir for example playing like the james bond character so totally so the idea of getting into a simulation world and and you know it being um completely indulged in it is, is, is something that actually la- lasts for a while and uh shout out to sir arthur conan doyle and brian allen lane who wrote that one mm-hmm. sir arthur conan doyle wrote uh sherlock holmes initially so they when they're pulling all basically they just said all right this is your story yeah. we're gonna put it into a star trek story and yeah you're right that this kind of is the first time that they're really going deep i mean i guess picard did something in the holodeck too but this is really going deeper into that you know with where bashir and o'brien really you know they do the battle of midway or something like that and and kira and dax were like Maid Marian, or I don't remember exactly what they did, but they were like princesses in one episode where they meet Worf and they're pulling off their hats. So a lot of fun. Yeah. This this kind of helped to grow the whole holodeck that, fantasy. The, yes, the whole holodeck fantasy program. Even if you far go as far as uh lower decks and the whole Mark Twain, the twaining of the you know characters, that is lent that still borrows from this kind totally. of idea, right? Totally. And speaking of Lower Decks, uh, the next episode is Season 2, Episode 4, The Outrageous Okana. Uh, Now, Okana is a character that came back in Star Trek Prodigy and Star Trek Lower Decks. So he was a weird character. He shows up. Everybody's fallen in love with him. Boys, girls, adults, children, doesn't matter. And I was watching it like, why does this work? It doesn't. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some people are like, oh, my God, he's so dreamy. But when I watched him, I was like, I don't know. Kind of seems weird. What did you think? Um, wasn't that taken away with the episode? Surprised that it, you know, becomes like this big lure for some character that continuously kind of finds itself back in the mix. Um, I drew Ca- uh, Captain O'Connor's uh, engine core because I thought that it looked really cool. Whoever did the the graphics for that are the design build for that. It had that dome in the middle and it looked mm-hmm. like a little gyroscope type of cool thing. Also oh, remember that, yeah, Wolfies. the thing that he was carrying yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the, here's my little drawing of it, but, um, and then Whoopi's iconic hat, this hat right here became something that stood out and, uh, you know, you'll always remember for me. Um, but yeah, no, nothing too crazy to take away from this episode. Um, you know, Mostly, it, it, yeah, it didn't do that well as far as ratings. I see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mostly just the iconic character. Uh, yeah. The outrageous Okana is a character that is well remembered, and you know came back again in two different series. So he's definitely iconic. I think that's the biggest takeaway from that episode. And the next one is 
This one was really oh, interesting. Uh, uh, take take away line from that too. By the way, is data saying my timing is digital? That's one of the great <laughs> takeaway lines. Yeah, that's what Tasha Yar said. Um, episode five was loud as a whisper, and this one was really interesting because it introduced a character who speaks through three characters. The actor himself was deaf. The character was deaf. And it introduced this kind of interesting thought of like, he's speaking telepathically to these three people and these three people, their lives are devoted to communicating for him, which could set up some pretty awkward situations. But it was an interesting idea. And it was really cool that Star Trek was trailblazing and saying, look, we're going to have a deaf character we have a deaf actor playing it. You know, these are all very cool and important things uh, in an episode. Yeah. yeah, and that's one thing that they do, um, you know, pretty much consistently on Star Trek is take uh, certain kinds of nuances and, and really expand upon them. Um, this was a clever idea of having... Uh, I remember there was like different emotional sides of him. One was like the mm-hmm. the angry version of him, and one was like the the romantic artic, uh, artistic side of his personality, who spoke for that uh, side of him. Um, the only problem I had with this episode was there was little or no identity given to the people who spoke for the the deaf person in this episode. I felt like those characters should have given, been given more backstory. Um, we should have known more about their lives, the sacrifice that either they're willing to make the sacrifice to be this vessel of communication or they are unwilling or, you know, what, what is their existence about and what fulfills them? You know, um, also that was the episode. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned it then I meant to, I think I may have forgotten that, uh, The wife of a famous Star Trek actor played uh, one of the characters. I think it was Harmony. um, And her name is Marnie Mossiman, right? If I'm pronouncing that correctly. And she is the wife of John Delancey, which is really fun and interesting and not very well known. I remember seeing that and, and... I don't remember if we mentioned it in the episode, but yeah, so his wife, Marnie, was in yeah. that Next Generation episode, and she was Harmony. She was like the sweet lady of the three, people. I think it was two guys and her. So that's just an yeah. interesting little tidbit for everybody out there to enjoy. The next one was the Schizoid Man. Remember, this was a weird one. A dying antisocial scientist unintelligent, unintentionally comes upon the perfect vessel in which to perverse, pr- preserve his intellect and arrogant personality. Data. Remember, he, he was living alone with one lady. And I think he was like in love with this lady, but she was super young or much compared to him. And then he inhabited Data's body. And it's all it's obvious to all of us that he did that. But for some reason, it's not obvious to any of them. And then data starts acting all snicker, snicker, tee hee and flirty. And I'll do whatever I want and all this kind of stuff. I remember that was a strange one, but a lot of people really liked it. Yeah, um, it was a little strange. Um, it, the, the, the doctor was Ira Graves, uh, yeah. this molecular cybernetics guy. Um, but yeah, I thought it was weird. Um, uh, you know, what it did show was data's range. Uh, Brent Spiner has amazing kind of range as an actor to, to not only play human size, but also kind of do it with these, this tinge of robotics and Android that he's able to do. So the blend is amazing. I really, he's, he's one of the highlights for me of watching the first two seasons is watching Brad Spiner play Data. I think he's just exceptional at it. Um, and it's sometimes it's annoying where you want to do what uh, Picard do, does and say, Data, that's enough. And then sometimes <laughs> it's, it's good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I do remember this one. I um, also remember that 
you know, one of the big lines of this one was a dying man takes the time to mourn a man who will never know death. And that was kind of an interesting play on this this episode, I would say. Definitely. Now, uh, the next episode that we covered was episode seven. Uh, I believe that was Unnatural Selection. Enhanced DNA developments trigger an epidemic of rapid aging caught among its victims is Dr. Pulaski. If you remember, I, this was one that I remember as a kid because it was just, you know, people getting old and it's always kind of weird. And then looking at the weird aging makeup, that's always difficult to do. And then Pulaski's getting old. I'm like, she ain't got a lot of time, man. Hurry. You know? <laughs> and now, and we had a special guest for this episode. It was Dr. Muhammad Noor to explain to all of us that that's not possible to age that quickly, but there was a lot of interesting science that is possible, which Dr. Noor is always great at pointing out. But what do you think of that one? Uh, really enjoyed it. I thought this was a great episode. Uh, this is the kind of Twilight Zone stories that I like, you know, I, the kick yep. the can type of stories. Um, I thought it was a great, you know, when, when they do science-based stuff, they talked about the Thalusian flu and antibodies and quarantines and outbreaks. This was all kind of stuff that we had gone through recently with the pandemic. So it actually brought back some of those, um, you know, some of those ideas yep. and those things. They talked about sterilite and all of these things. So uh, it brought back things that we were already familiar with. They talked about linear models of viral propagation. These are all kinds of things that we would have, I would have less concern about or even knowledge of had we not gone through the pandemic but go going through that you know raises your antenna and certain keywords and this episode was full of those keywords I actually had omicron in the in the episode you are um, so right you're so right i remember all that because <laughs> four years ago we would be watching these and be like i don't know whatever i don't you know, know but nowadays we're like you better bro you better have a mask on is that n95 <laughs> then it's not worth you're not doing anything if it's not n95 come on you know you know we're like yeah we're just we're yeah. watching this thing and we're like i get it omicron watch out and you know there's a funny little <laughs> compilation about how differently they all say omicron in next in, in in star trek episodes there's it's like a little compilation where it's like omicron 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 oh and they're just all saying it differently <laughs> super funny but anyway that was a that, that's a good point. It did bring back those memories. Uh, the next one yeah. was, speaking of makeup, A Matter of Honor, where we get to meet our very first Benzite. No, no, that was in the first season. That was Mordok. This was the second one. This was Mendon, also played by John Putch. The first one was this guy, Mordok, my good buddy. Mm -hmm. And then that was John Putch. And then John Putch comes to play his brother, Mendon. And then Wesley Crusher makes the thing thing like, hey, Mordok. He's like, I am Mendon. And Wesley's like, oh, shoot, I guess all you guys don't look all the same. Or, or you do. I don't know. But it was pretty bad. But it was a great episode. I liked it very much. It was very memorable from back in the day when I was a kid. We also had Mr. Michael Westmore uh, joining us to talk about the makeup and all of his tireless work making this amazing you know, character and all the Emmys he wins for it. Uh, what did you think of it? uh yeah i mean it was fun to have uh you know michael westmore come and talk about you know the challenges that he kind of faced in the early seasons of uh next generation and how he created on the fly um very good stuff i also think that we got to see a klingon bird of prey in this episode which was also a highlight for me one of the things i i, I drew in this episode um because it, it just the way the ship looked was super cool here's my rendition of that klingon bird of prey right there wow. um but yeah i i definitely enjoyed it um mm -hmm. they also had some kind of subatomic bacteria kind of plot line in this episode as well so that was mm -hmm. add, added to the science of it but um but yeah it was a good episode yeah very memorable uh, definitely one of the most memorable of the second season, I believe. And a lot of people really like it, um, including myself. The next one, episode nine, speaking of an episode people like, this is, according to IMDb, 
a top rated episode. It's a 9.1. That might be the highest rated Next Generation episode. Certainly one of them. Certainly one of the, the highest rated of the early ones. Uh, we had two yeah. special guests joining us. We had our good buddy co-host, Denise Crosby, coming back for this one. And we had the writer of the episode, Melinda M. Snodgrass, joining us. Huge episode, right? Yeah. This was a big uh, episode. Um, this uh, We had poker in this episode, right? This is Melinda yes. Snodgrass gave us the, the, the sitting around playing poker. I love Data's visor that he was wearing, that little glass kind of looking hat, uh, poker hat. Um, we got references to the Stargazer um from picard and kind of a little bit of his backstory there in this episode um and yeah just very good it was about the the rights of data um mm -hmm. about him not being treated like property but being treated like uh, uh a human or a yeah. person somebody who's uh you know um a living breathing individuals so this was about this really had um elements of civil rights um you know of about you know a lot of the struggles that black people went through in in, in america kind of were incited um feelings wise while mm -hmm. watching this episode for me absolutely this is a lot of people consider this to be the best episode of next generation ever it's amazing that that happened in the second season. That's why it's such an anomaly. It kind of takes you aback. You're like, wow, how did they come up with something so good in the second season, which was pretty choppy. Um, yeah. But the next one is episode 10, The Dauphin, where uh, Wesley falls for the young future leader of Dalid 4. This was the one where she had the old lady with her and she they turn into Ewoks, then they turn into a Wookiee, and then they, they're like fighting Worf, and then like Worf kind of, flirts with the old lady and you're like are they will they won't they and we don't get <laughs> we don't get them to hook up but you never know yeah. what might happen in the future that one was kind of yeah weird and coming off of such a good episode prior to this this was a little bit of a you know a dip on the roller coaster so yep yeah you got such a great episode with measure of man and, and going back to that a little bit I want to bring back Guinan's scene where she has that scene with Picard in 10 forward where she kind of brings up the fact that, oh, you know, disposable creatures that do the dirty work. And Picard says slavery. You mean like slavery? Um, totally. I thought it was I thought it was very good and excellent um, acting on Whoopi Goldberg's part uh, as mm -hmm. well. So I just wanted to make sure I highlighted that. Um, but yes, this episode, I, I, I just, I, the, the funny, once she turned into that funny little creature and stuff, uh, <laughs> that's when they lost me. There it goes right there. That's all I need to say. About that episode. That's really good though. Like you, you really, you do these little doodles, <laughs> but they're very clear what they are. Like it's, that's spot on. So moving yeah. on to the next guy is episode 11 contagion. We had our good buddy, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, joining us uh, to talk about some of those guys. What were those guys? I already forgot what they're called, but the, uh, I can't remember. The Iconians. Us, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the Iconians, which we've talked about in other series as well. So Dr. Trek gave us all of his great knowledge on that one. Do you remember that one? Uh a little bit, a little bit. I yeah. remember the idea was this kind of ro galactic Rosetta Stone that was able to like, right, um, translate culturally. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Um, the, the line that I remember as a takeaway was China was a myth until Marco Polo. That was a Picard line. And yeah, there was a lot of uh, mythology in there. It made me think of the Egyptian civilization and um, Atlantis and all of those kinds of things. Totally. Um, so yeah, uh, it was interesting stuff there. Yeah. This is the, the episode where we got the line, the knitter isn't working, though. And I, I'll oh, never forget that. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's the one, huh? The knitter's not working. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Moving on, uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to take a very quick break, everybody. That is the first half of season two. The second half gets crazy. 
So stick around. We will be right back on the seventh rule.